Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum Podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy and my partner here, Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? Tom, did you see the uh, second largest diamond ever was found in Zimbabwe? Or no, wait, Botswana. I did not. Uh, it's like this big. It looks like a, I mean, how, I don't know. It's big. How big is that big? Uh, about 2,500 carats. Wow. So you might have to trade in your uh, wife's uh, engagement ring for that. So. Yeah, yeah. Wait till she finds out that's not real. What? There's lab, <laughs> lab diamonds. You can't tell the difference. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm a, I'm... Good thing we don't publish this anywhere yeah. where anybody listens. Right? <laughs> All right. Um, let's jump into uh, our outline. We'll do our uh, a planning topic, asset allocation. Um, we'll then do our Dr. Doom ETF, and then we'll finish on our central bank roundup. So asset, asset allocation. Um, so asset allocation location. Uh, so Tom, the idea here is pretty straightforward, which is, you know, you work with a planner or maybe you decide on yourself, what do I want my overall asset allocation to be? But then there's a lot of different places you can put the money. Uh, and most people have a brokerage account, uh, 401k at work. Maybe they have an IRA. These might be traditional. They might be Roth. Uh, some people might have NOLs where they can offset taxes. There's a lot of different things to consider when it comes to where to put different asset classes. So the first thing I would say is, you know, I'll use an easy one as an example, and then we'll roll from there. So municipal bonds, uh, for most people, if you buy them properly, so if you're in a certain state that charges state income tax, you have to buy those. But say you're in a state like Texas, where we're both based, there's no state income tax. So when I buy for clients in Texas or myself, municipal bonds, and I put them in a roach account, we don't pay federal income tax on that. So having them in a brokerage account is great. But if I were to put those in a IRA, whether it be a traditional or a Roth IRA, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because municipal bonds tend to have a lower interest rate than taxable bonds because they're tax free. So you want to put things that have a high tax burden in tax protected accounts and things with a low tax burden in ones where they're taxable. So I'll let you jump off from there. No, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point. One thing we look at when doing the planning is, um, especially when you enter retirement and you're looking at the distribution phase, there's a lot of different strategies when it comes to how you're going to live off of your income. And it's all about uh, not what you make, but what you keep. So there's different tax strategies. I like that for you. That, I like that a lot. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. And taxes, you know, I don't know if they're going up, but they're probably not going down. But, you know, one thing that we try to focus on early on is, you know, how much should I put in my Roth versus my, my traditional 401k? Um, you know, you want to, there's no, there's no, you know, it's not black and gray, but you want to take a big variable out of the equation at the end of the day. And that is where taxes are going to be. And if you have some money that's going to be tax free, like a Roth, or if you have some after tax accounts, you want to make sure that when you're taking the distributions, you do it in the appropriate way. It's not just you take out of your IRA first or your Roth or your traditional brokerage account. There's there's a rhyme and reason on, on why we, we separate those because you don't want to get bumped up into a tax bracket. So I think that's one, one area when you talk about asset location is, okay, you have your pre-tax, your, your, your tax free, which is going to be your Roth, and then your after tax, like a traditional brokerage account. Um, I think the other aspect of asset location and i like how you frame that is well you're going to have your your different types of buckets and you know i i usually keep it pretty simple you have your short-term bucket which is just your emergency fund your midterm and long term and those risk profiles can be all different it's not a one size fits all just because you're 40 years old and you might be very aggressive you can treat those buckets differently um and you can take different risks in certain areas and sometimes it may may make sense to take more risk in your in your tax deferred accounts like your IRA or Roth because you don't have to pay taxes on those transactions when you sell a security if it's up or down versus an after tax account when you trade 
and you sell something that's up, well, you're going to have a taxable gain. And that's when you get into tax loss harvesting and different ways to offset that. But you treat those buckets very, very differently from a tax standpoint and also from, from a risk standpoint. All right, let's make it a little bit of a game so it can be uh, a little more fun. So that way we uh, give some actual takeaways people can use. So, Tom, I'll ask you, uh, you know, just kind of use an example of an investment and you tell me where bucket of uh, <laughs> tax location you think it fits best. And I'll see if I think you're right or wrong. So corporate bond funds, best in a brokerage account or best in an IRA? Best in an IRA. I think that's the absolute correct answer. Uh, separately managed accounts. Well, hold on. Let's let's explain why we think that. Oh yeah, good idea. <laughs> so, so as you were saying, I was just trying to jump ahead to the quiz. I was going rapid as, fire, lightning. As round. you were saying, you know, bonds are great because they're supposed to be protection and they're more conservative. Unless you have years like twenty two, when you have these anomalies and interest rates jump up. But for the most part, bonds pay a dividend or an interest rate, and well, they pay ordinary income yeah, tax. Interest. And it's it's that's, that's and problem. it's taxed at ordinary income. And what's also taxed at ordinary income that a lot of people forget are money markets and CDs. So CDs having these higher rates right now of five, five and a half percent, that's great. But if it's an after-tax account and you're in the 35% tax bracket, well, that rate of return is really closer to 3%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I'll stick with the uh, kind of, we'll say yield focus thing, but how about a high yielding stock fund? Uh, or a high yielding mutual fund that maybe holds a real bit real estate investments, uh, such as a REIT. Where where are we going to put that? So I, I think you could put those in either or, but if from a tax standpoint, it makes more sense to put it in an after tax account because you're going to get taxed at the capital gains rate, which is twenty percent versus ordinary income. So those you're going to have obviously stock funds and individual stocks or REITs. Um, in IRAs, which is fine, but you can also have them in an after-tax account because it is still tax efficient. Now, with dividends on stock funds, even if you're re this, this is a common misconception. Even if you're reinvesting, let's say you buy, you know, AT and T and it's yielding a four percent dividend, and you're reinvesting that dividend back into the stock, you're not using it as income. You are still responsible for the income every year at twenty percent, or it could be twenty five percent, depending on your tax bracket. Yeah. So what if you have an actively managed, actively managed mutual fund with a lot of turnover? Is that better in a brokerage account or in an IRA? So that's better than an IRA. And the, and the reason being is mutual funds, um, they pass on the distributions, the taxes. Mutual fund is, let's call it a, a large cap growth fund. All that fund is, is a collection mm -hmm. of large cap growth stocks. Well, those managers throughout the year are making changes, buying and selling those stocks because it's actively managed and there are tax consequences. Mutual funds pass on that tax liability at the end of the year to the individual shareholders. So one strategy is if you have it in an after-tax account, you can get out of that mutual fund before that tax burden is passed down to you. But you could have your own individual gains by when you purchase that mutual fund that you might have to pay. So there's there's a lot that goes into that strategy, but mutual funds, in my opinion, are best used in tax deferred accounts like an IRA because you don't have to worry about paying those taxes at the end of the year. Yeah, well, let's contrast that with a passively managed ETF index fund. Uh, where, where I mean, you can put it in any of the buckets for sure, but... Where, where would you say it's most efficiently? Uh, that's that's in an after-tax account. E ETFs don't pass on those those capital gains tax at the end of the year. So that's why when we use after-tax accounts, we're really cognizant of, well, one, cost, but two, tax strategy. And ETFs are a much more efficient way to manage overall tax strategy than mutual funds because mutual funds, again, to your point, they're actively managed. You don't have control of what they're buying and selling. And you can have some pretty significant capital gains tax at the end of the year, mutual funds that are passed down to you. And you could maybe buy that mutual fund in November and all of a sudden they declare their capital gains in December that's getting passed on. And even though you only own that mutual fund for a month, you are still responsible for, for that tax burden. Yeah. So the last piece I would say on this is just to say that if you have an overall asset allocation, let's say it's 60% stocks, 40% bonds, that classic moderate portfolio, but you own a taxable account, a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA, those three buckets, are not going to look the same if you're being efficient with your asset location in the sense that the traditional IRA might have a ton of bonds in it and the taxable account might have almost none. 
uh, but it'll have a ton of efficient ETFs like the passively managed equities. Yeah, that's a good point. When you, if you're in a 60 40 portfolio, it doesn't mean all your, indi- it means your full picture is, should be in a 60 40 portfolio, but that's going to be split up between those different different buckets. And that's actually a good point to, to bring up. Yeah. So something to consider. Um, obviously, we've talked before about the advantages of using 529 for the tax advantages for saving for college. We've discussed HSAs of having a kind of a healthcare savings account. I heard somebody else call it a healthcare IRA, and I thought that was a really easy way to think about it. Uh, those are just some basic everyday things that you can do that improve your long term picture without much effort. Yeah. And the HSAs are great. It's the only vehicle out there that is triple tax free. I call it. It's all pre-tax money goes into it. It grows tax deferred and it's all tax free when you use it for the qualified expenses. You know, not just healthcare. Yeah, that's great. Well, Tom, let's move over. Um, and we have a, it's, I'll call this a special segment because we don't have, it's not something or nothing. It's not, you know, you, one of the usual games we play. It's just really, (laughs) <laughs> kind of an interesting story, which is there's a guy out there named Nurel Rubini, who's commonly known as Dr. Doom. They got him on CNBC every time you see that big bear and the market sell off or you know some crazy things happening. Uh, I know he's an economist. I know he's a guy that's looked at markets. Um, but one thing he's never done is actually manage money. And at 66 years old, he's launching his own ETF. He thinks the 60-40 portfolio is dead. Tail risks are important. And he wants people to own a basket of negatively, negatively correlated assets. I, I personally, I welcome to the arena. You know, it's great when you've called 15 of the last three recessions uh, and you want to come manage money. I think it'll be entertaining. Uh, but he's he's kind of all over the place. He, he's kind of described it as almost an everything ETF. He wants to tokenize the fund like some of the cryptocurrencies. He's got some really big ideas out there. Um, but how do you not comment on what's going on with Dr. Doom? And he finally says, now's the time at 66. I'm going to open up a fund. Yeah, you know, it's uh, every recession is different. Um, the markets are constantly evolving, they're changing, and they don't work the same way they worked 50 years ago. I mean, you see that today with the, the self, self, self traders and do it your own and how much money is going in and out. Uh, you know, listen, there's a lot of go anywhere type of strategies, mutual funds, ETFs. And I think that could be good if you're just starting out and you don't want to have to pick your own, or you don't have someone that's doing it for you. But, um, yeah, I, I welcome the idea too. I'll see, you know, at sixty six how how well he's gonna be able to do. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, they're out there already. There's a lot of funds out there and ETFs that you know market to. We have zero correlation or even negative correlation. We're buying everything from real assets to to crypto to stocks, bonds, et cetera. Um, you know. And they make a lot of money on doing that. They collect a, a ton of assets. They charge high internal fees for something like this. I would be my guess, even though it's through an ETF structure. So uh, we'll see if he's able to call the next next recession. And even if he does call the next recession, does he know what to invest in to to make money? Because um, again, they're all well. They're all the different. other thing is, you know, this to me is a little bit of a classic. Uh, you know, obviously selling fear, but. It's a ton of buzzwords. You know, he uses words like climate resilient investments. He talks about rebuilding U.S. infrastructure, wants to ensure food security, wants to do something about reshoring production of green metals and rare earths back to the United States. It's just it's like this everything thing <laughs> just because, oh, we're going to do this for it. We're going to do that for it. We're going to do this for it. We're going to do it. And, you know, I think it's just important to remember that this is not easy. And especially when you've been on the sidelines going on CBC, throwing rocks that, you know, now he's going to start living in the glass house and uh, he's going to be having a track record. He's got to be accountable for is going to be uh, it'll be a different experience than he's had before. Yeah, all the buzzwords. I mean, ESG. I mean, if that doesn't have egg on its face, I don't know what does. I mean, that I, that's that's not even an opinion. It doesn't work. Um, it's it's a nice it's a nice thought that you're able to help out the environment. But people don't even realize that these ESG funds, it's Im- almost impossible to directly weed out some of the things that they're screening for because there's so much indirect exposure that these companies mm-hmm. um, are doing that they're saying that that they're not doing so it's 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 a fad and it's a it's a buzzword and throwing out cryptocurrencies and it's a it's a basket of everything that we want to hear and uh yeah i agree with you i don't think it's gonna work the way he thinks it does yeah yeah no it's uh i i think it's entertaining it's worth pointing out and 
uh, good luck to him. So now on to the main event, our uh, one of our favorite segments, which is the Central Bank Roundup. Shine those boots. It's time for Ooh, Central Bank Roundup. Tom, our central bankers around the world are having a busy summer. Usually you go to the beach, you read a book, you hang out a little bit, but we've had uh, what's termed yen Yenmageddon. We've had central banks in Europe diverging, going in different directions. Last Friday, we had Jerome Powell, you know, had, a, had quite a background. Uh, the Teton Mountains uh, come out and talk about the need to change the path of rates for the United States. Uh, we're going to hit them all, but where do you want to start? Well, let's start. Let's start in a backyard. Um, there's, we're finally there. Um, I don't, unless something comes out of left field, they're going to lower <laughs> rates for the first time. And, um, since eight, 2018, um, since I started hiking them in 2021, but the last time they hiked and lowered was the end of 18. Jerome Powell was, uh, just took over as the Fed chair from Janet Yellen. And it uh, looks like they're going to cut rates at their September meeting, which I believe is September 15th or September 18th, actually. And it looks, the market's pricing in a 50-50 that they go either 25 basis points or, or 50 basis points. Um, the market's pricing in by year end that will be a full percent lower than we're at than we're at right now so the question is is it's not if it's just by how much and how quickly do they drop rates and that's that's what that's how these markets are moving right now day to day by day to your point jerome powell had his had his uh conference in jackson hole and um the markets liked what he said he was more dovish than expected and i think you'll i think it's time to, to start dropping rates which will be a tailwind for a lot of industries and sectors and in the, in the market overall well, I think it'll be a tailwind eventually. Um, Dr. David Kelly over at JP Morgan uh, pointed out recently that the first cuts are actually bad for the economy uh, because people start to panic and they get nervous. So he said kind of has a J shape effect. So initially it's actually kind of stop spending because you go, well, if they are cutting rates, that means there's something wrong. What do they know that we don't know? And so it has a negative effect for the first couple of rates. But then, like you said, eventually those rate, lower rates do help whether it's small businesses or just businesses in general, do a lot more uh, with those lower rates, have higher cash flows, a lot of positive things. Maybe people are able to refi some mortgage rates in the past few years and they end up with a little more cash flow as well. So initially it'll frighten people. And I think, you know, there'll be a little bit of surprise of why are equities going down? Why are people pulling back? But longer term, lower rates do help stimulate. Uh, and I think it will provide some more bandwidth for for growth. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're long term, the FMO, F FOMC's long-term projection uh, is 2.8%. There's no duration on their term long-term, so we don't know what that means, but they want to get it down to 2.8%. Um, I think having it at zero like we had, it was way too low for way too long. The market's long-term projection is right around 3%, so kind of in line. But yeah, to your point, if they drop by 50% basis points. Everyone thinks that's going to be really, really good. And I think that's going to scare the market because what do they see that no one else does? And when you're lowering mm -hmm. rates, ideally you're in, you're in an economy that's in recession um, and you want to stimulate growth, et cetera. So this is, we've never been here before because every time they've never had a soft landing, every time they've lowered rates, it's <laughs> yeah. because they've had to lower rates. So the question is, why are they lowering rates? And Powell may pull this off if he just does 25 basis points every quarter um, for the next couple years and nothing breaks, but that's uh, to be determined. Yeah, I remember during the COVID sell-off back in March of 2020, I was having a conversation with a client on a Monday and then they were supposed to present on a Wednesday and they were telling me, oh, what do you think is going to happen? Well, they're going to cut rates. They've kind of indicated they're going to cut rates. And I go, but if they cut 25, everything's okay. But if they cut 50... The market's going to crash. And sure enough, uh, you know, it went down and went down hard uh, shortly after that because that 50 basis point, it does seem to be a bit of an overreaction and a little bit of panic. And people go, uh oh, if 25, I can deal with 25 over, you know, 12 weeks, sure. But uh, 50 real quick, uh oh, why do they have to move so quickly? So, yeah, so much. So quickly? Yeah, you're getting back into this environment where good news is bad news and bad news is bad news. Um, there's really, they can't win because if they don't cut, that's that that's not good. And then they're, they're holding for too long. If they do cut, it's going to see a knee jerk reaction, probably in a negative way. And if they cut too much, um, there's a lot of fear in the market. So we'll see if they're able to, to, pull, to pull this off. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to my favorite central bank, the Bank of Japan. 
they uh, they caused a little bit of chaos at the beginning of the month, didn't they? They uh, raised rates from, we'll call it zero to a quarter point and nearly broke the world. Uh, <laughs> equity markets in Japan, I think we're down 12% that day. The U.S. was down around 3% at one point. Uh, it sounded like margin calls were happening to, we'll say, highly levered organizations and investment funds. Uh, it also seems to be over, even though, I mean, the yen has strengthened a lot since then. But uh, any comments on yen Yenmageddon? Yeah, I mean, they were, they're a little late to the party. Um, every bank in the world has been cutting rates over the last two years. Some took a little bit longer than others. Some raised a lot quicker than others. Uh, and Japan was the one that, that, that held steady. And then out of nowhere, they start raising rates. Um, so they're a little bit behind the ball. And uh, yeah, I think the market got spooked. You saw that day a couple of weeks ago when you had the VIX, which we've talked about, which is the fear indicator, um, jumped up dramatically. Uh, I think it hit, what was it? Uh, the high of it, 60, 68, 70. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> there was a great chart I saw that, you know, it said, you know, world ending from COVID, 2008 financial crisis, 9-11, other times that it spiked above 50. And then, you know, it had a, a kind of a comment of, you know, Bank of Japan raises rates a quarter point and slightly weak jobs number on a Friday. <laughs> yeah. It, it kind of reminded me a little bit of like the flash crash in 2011. Um, oh, that's a good one. I like that. Just, spiked and then everything returned returned to normal and it was just you know you might hear about the yen carry trade and kind of just explain it to our listeners it's basically people were borrowing at all-time low rates uh, in japan and then just reinvesting that money back somewhere else with higher rates you know for instance the us but when that borrowing rate goes up they're over levered and you had all these these capital calls that were that were that were being done and there was a lot of money that i mean that yen carry trade has been going on for years and it's cyclical it it, it it comes and goes but that's been going on for the last almost two decades um and a lot of people got caught i think it got, got caught off sides on it and you saw this crazy listen the markets are more more global than they have ever been everything's tied to one another so when japan raises bit 25 basis points, everything has is affected and you have this massive exiting and volatility. And that's what we saw. Yeah, I think that that's, um, that's very fair. I think the leverage part of it, I mean, people were levered 10 to one or 20 to one on that trade. Uh, it, it gets unwound on a margin call really quickly and you have forced selling. Uh, fortunately, it, it happened pretty quickly and it seemed to end, but it also seemed that the Bank of Japan was told, cut it out, <laughs> stop, take a break for a minute. So this story might not be over. Yeah, and, and by the way, I would say of the population of people invested, this affects probably 1%. Uh, it affects zero people on this, uh, listening to this call. It doesn't affect us. Well, it's life earning for a small percentage of people. Uh, for everybody else, it's a blip on the radar. Yeah, this is, these are, these are sovereign sovereign banks, um, investment banks, these are, this has nothing to do with how you're invested. We don't, no one's doing yen carry trades. Now it affects, has ripple effect over the market and you have the volatility, et cetera, the indirect effect. But yeah, this affects such a small, small percentage of the, the world investing population, if you will, that it's, it's kind of funny. It's almost irrelevant to, to the point that it's not because you saw what, the, what, what it did with the volatility in the market. But creates buying opportunities and a lot of things went on sale for a couple of days. Um, and now we're back almost at all time highs. Yeah. Well, let's move over to Europe real quick because I want to finish with the bank of Sweden or rather the central bank of Sweden. So Rick's bank, um, they cut their policy rate by 25 basis points to three and a half. They started easing their policy back in May uh, because they saw early on that inflation was under control. I think it's an interesting case study because Sweden did so many things different during kind of the COVID panic. Uh, that they seem to have a very independent spirit in that country and their central bank is doing it as well. So they're going to be, I'll say, five, six months ahead of the European Central Bank and the U.S. Federal Reserve with their rate cuts. Uh, and they've seen housing prices fall sharply. They've seen challenges. They think that they're in a clear recession uh, and they are taking action uh, ahead of everyone else. So I don't know if this is a canary in the coal mine. I don't know if they're just a unique economy that's getting hit harder than others and they need to move faster. But what's kind of your take on the uh, Swedish central bankers 
taking action earlier than everyone else. Yeah, I think uh, I think Canada did too as as well. Um, I mean, listen, someone's got to go first. Um, I don't know if they just wait to see who's going to be the guinea pig and see how it how it affects or. I think it's good that they're somewhat operating independently of, of each other, but I think you're going to see other follows. I mean, we're about to cut next month and I think we'll see other banks around the world start to cut because it, they're all, they're all looking at the same data. It's inflation and different countries have different, you know, inflection points and, and different inflation numbers and what's going on, et cetera. So uh, they, I think it's, it, it's the right move. And I'm glad to see that some are starting the cut and uh, we'll see what it looks like. Yeah, I think the last takeaway I'd have is just, you know, we mentioned we don't know what the neutral rate is and that R star that the Fed always talks about, you know, for Sweden, they had their policy rate set uh, at uh, 4% for eight years <laughs> and then finally had to do a cut to 375 and now they're going further from there. But, you know, neutral rate can be the neutral rate for eight years and then it's not so neutral anymore. It's too restrictive or it can be too loose. So uh, I think that that number does move around and, you know, whether it's two and a half here or three and a half, like they said in a long term report, uh, it's something we got to watch because it, it does matter. And uh, we're going to see it other places first. Yeah. You know, speaking of the neutral rate, too, it's such a funny thing because, you know, the Fed's long term average is 2.8, which is essentially you know, what I've heard is they want to be 1% over in, in inflation. And if their target mm -hmm. inflation is two, it's great. But inflation, if they get to two, it's not going to stay at two. <laughs> you know, Jeff, Jeffrey right. Gunlag said to the point too, like they just think it's magically going to stop at two. You might, if, if you, if you restrict too much, you might, you're going to blow through two and then you're going to go into disinflation. So, you know, just like from 2009 to 2020, Inflation was under one percent for for most of that decade. Yeah, they couldn't get it going. They couldn't get inflation and, off the and ground. And they couldn't get off the ground. Then all of a sudden, we go to nine overnight. So they're not going to magically stop at two. That neutral rate is going to, I think, fluctuate. Which then, in return, you're going to have interest rates fluctuate. So um, I think they have at least they have a good idea of where they want to get it to. But yeah, getting inflation down to two and keeping it there is is. It's, it's never been done. And it's not going to happen this time around. So it's going to continue to fluctuate and it's going to be this ever evolving cycle. The important thing to know is just how do you invest during those cycles? How do you, how do you protect the assets? What asset classes do well, what don't do well. And you know, those that's topic for another, another, another podcast. But um, yeah, I think it's hopefully everything's moving in the right direction and we'll see if they can pull off this, this soft landing. That's well, well anticipated. Well, we thank our central bankers for all the action. It gives us something good to talk about, and uh, we'll look forward to catching up after Labor Day. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.